uh, work and it's a great uh, memorable first day for everyone to be back. So thanks again to everybody being here. Well, this uh, committee will now uh, come to, to order. And uh, I think I wanna begin by just explaining why, why we're here uh, in Detroit. Uh, last week, uh, the Senate uh, Commerce Committee had a hearing in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, about semiconductors and the role that they play in manufacturing uh, and uh, throughout uh, our economy. Uh, but today we're bringing uh, the committee to Michigan uh, because it's, it's here where it's, this is not an abstract uh, concept by, by any means. Uh, this is where auto manufacturing, uh, the chip shortage uh, and related challenges are, are all taking place uh, each, each and every day. And, uh, and uh, this is where I think we uh, will be continued to lead uh, into the future as well from, uh, from the greater Detroit area and the state of Michigan. Our communities uh, and families are, are steeped in these issues and it's important to, to have this conversation among the, the people and the places that are actually experiencing them. Uh, Michigan established uh, the American auto industry, transforming mobility and society, and quite frankly, built the American middle class and will continue leading for many years in the future. When Henry Ford introduced uh, the first Model T of, on the assembly line in uh, 1908, uh, it, it did not contain a single semiconductor chip. It's pretty a pretty amazing feat that he was able to do that without a semiconductor chip. <laughs> Uh, and uh, indeed, several more decades uh, went by, and that continued to, to be the case. But by the 1970s, uh, some cars started to contain a handful of chips. Uh, the role of chips in automobiles has ballooned since then, and today's modern cars uh, have <laughs> roughly uh, 1,000 semiconductor chips or more, spanning very cost uh, functions and technologies. And uh, a little, I even have a few chips right here uh, of how tiny, imagine this little tiny wafer about the size of my thumbnail, the, the power that it has and the influence uh, that it has, and then multiply that by a thousand uh, throughout an automobile. And given these uh, developments, uh, it's no surprise that the global chip shortage uh, following COVID-19 pandemic has uh, devastated uh, uh, impact, has had a devastating impact on the auto industry. This chip <laughs> shortage uh, resulted in temporary layoffs, uh, causing hardships for workers in a already challenging time. It also cut into one of the main drivers of our national economy, which is auto production. As President Biden has said uh, when he was visiting both Ford and General Motors uh, here in Michigan, quote, the future of the auto industry is electric. And I would uh, make a small addition to that statement that the future of the auto industry is electric as well as connected and autonomous. In terms of electrification, uh, the novel semiconductor technologies promise to reduce uh, charging times, extend range, and enhance performance for electric vehicles, uh, among others. And not only will electric vehicles help save our planet by combating climate change, they will also reduce our dependence on foreign energy sources and protect Americans from unpredictable gas prices. When it comes to connected and autonomous vehicles, semiconductor chips will power uh, the artificial intelligence and uh, other capabilities necessary to make self-driving cars a reality. Uh, this aspiration can't become a reality soon enough because uh, as we were talking about earlier, lives are literally at stake uh, in, for this technology. Tragically, recent data shows that for the, first time, for the first nine months of 2021, an estimated 31,720 people died in car crashes. And that represents a 12% increase uh, uh, over 2022. Uh, this is completely unacceptable. Achieving a future with uh, zero fatalities uh, on our roads will be a challenge and require many, many approaches. Uh, and there is unfortunately no silver bullet to accomplish that. But autonomous vehicles hold great promise to play a major role in reducing injuries and deaths by eliminating human error and impaired driving, which is commonly involved in the vast majority of our crashes. Uh, these uh, trends, electrification and autonomy, mean that in the coming years, chips will play an even greater role in the most essential functions of, an, of automobiles, both driving and powering uh, the vehicle. So how do we prepare for this future? And how do we prevent a repeat of problems like we have with the current uh, chip shortage? Well, we need to shore up our supply chains by making things that we need right here in America. Pretty straightforward. The pandemic has certainly uh, delivered a very uh, painful message in that regard. Our supply chains are efficient, but they are not resilient. 
So when something goes wrong, problems pile up very quickly, depriving Americans of the things that they rely on, which, and which also contributes to rising inflation. And much of this is due to the fact that we're too reliant on overseas production. Through my role uh, leading the Committee on uh, Homeland Security and Government Affairs in 2019, I released a report on prescription drugs. Among other issues, we found that America was over-reliant on foreign manufacturers for prescription drug materials and that we were poorly prepared in the event uh, of a future pandemic. That was in 2019. Shortly thereafter, uh, we knew the uh, pandemic did indeed hit us. And as we know, the nation experienced challenges with PPE and other supply chain uh, issues that uh, limited our ability to uh, have a, a quick uh, COVID-19 response. Unfortunately, companies such as uh, General Motors, Ford and Solantis, uh, as well as our auto suppliers, uh, stepped up, as they always step up, but they stepped up during the pandemic by repurposing their facilities to produce essential items like respirators and, and masks. But in the long term, we need a national strategy to protect our economy. Whether it has to do with chips for the auto industry or other essential goods and materials, we need to start securing critical supply chains. And this is something we're already doing when it comes uh, to national defense. As a former Naval officer in the US uh, Navy Reserve uh, and now a member of the Senate uh, Armed Services uh, Committee, I have fought to ensure that uh, critical uh, assets are made here in the United States. Uh, for example, Marionette Marine, which is uh, right along the Michigan Wisconsin border is uh, building uh, Navy combat ships today uh, with about half of the workers coming from Michigan, employing uh, hundreds of them. Uh, we would, uh, I will say uh, uh, emphatically, uh, we will never rely on the Chinese government to build our US Navy warships, never. That will never ever happen. Uh, we will build them here in America uh, with American workers to ensure in times of need our military is prepared. We must apply that same approach here with semiconductor chips, especially how they are central to everything from automobiles to life-saving medical devices. And that's why it's imperative for the Congress to fully fund the CHIPS Act. In particular, we need to pass legislation that I led with Senator Stabenow that would provide $2 billion to incentivize domestic manufacture of so-called mature chips uh, that are in short supply and that manufacturers of all kinds uh, rely on, especially uh, in the auto industry. This $2 billion is in addition to a $50 billion investment to ensure that the United States becomes the leader in the manufacture of advanced chips and other Is it, is it on now? Good. Uh, here's the bottom line. We must uh, remain focused on making our supply chains resilient by manufacturing critical goods in America. And that includes semiconductor chips, but other supplies that are essential to millions of American jobs like the auto industry. So I look forward to hearing uh, today's uh, testimony about how we can build up American uh, auto manufacturing and our economy by leveraging American-made chips and critical supply chains and with that, uh, it's now my pleasure to, uh, to introduce our esteemed witnesses uh, to provide uh, their opening uh, comments. Uh, our first witness today is uh, Mr. Steve Dawes, who is the UAW Region 1D Director. Mr. Dawes is, uh, was elected to his current role in February of 2020. And over the years, he has held many leadership roles at the UAW. He has dedicated his time and energy to helping his fellow auto workers and creating opportunities for the next generation and the subcommittee is certainly very grateful uh, for your service, Mr. Dawes, and your participation today. You're recognized for your opening comments. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Steve Dawes. Um, thank you um, for this opportunity. I'm a, a UAW Region 1D, right, 1D director. Region 1D uh, serves a membership of 73 of the 83 counties in Michigan. I'd like to start by thanking you, Senator Peters, for this opportunity to have this open discussion on semiconductor chips and the impact that it's having on our work sites. Uh, Mr. Senator, on behalf of myself and the Region 1D membership, thank you for your continued fight for our country and Michigan working men and women. 
So to fully understand the chip issue as it relates to the automotive sector, one must really understand the function of the modern automobile. My references will primarily be related to General Motors heavy duty truck assembly in Flint, Michigan, but also runs parallel to almost all other vehicles. Today's truck, truck functions and accessories are mostly fully run with electronics. Electronics control your brakes, steering, your fuel management, your radio, your lights, your cameras, your heated seats, your heated steering wheel, your speedometer, your dashboard, them are just a few. Many of these functions were historically operated with cables, shafts, mechanical uh, methods. Now each of these functions are controlled by a dedicated module. Each of these modules contain chips. These modules may contain one chip for the more basic function or many chips for the higher functioning module. So Senator, what I've done is provided some, some pictures for you of uh, in, in your um, pamphlet right there. So the first picture you'll see is actually a module of your XM radio and your radio in a vehicle. As you can see from one is the top view, number two is the side view, and you can see the, the, the numerous uh, electronic um, connectors that are hooked onto these things. Um, three is the bottom of view. Again, another set of three connectors that come in, and this is just for your XM radio to receive and, and communicate back to the computer. The, the second set of, of pictures are what we refer to as a BCM, which is the brake control module. And in both pictures, you can see where um, there are seven different areas of connection and, and out outputs in these modules. And any of these modules, again, retain the chips. The brake control module is one of the one of the more important um, modules in a vehicle. Uh, they interface between the brake panel and the, and the master cylinder, senses the amount of pressure from your foot to the brakes. It talks to the rest of the braking system, including the anti-lock brake function, along with your wheel sensors, et cetera. It's a very complex piece of, of the, uh, the vehicle. There are many more modules that contain chips. Um, some of the more important ones are actually the um, brake control module, the engine control module that controls all of the functions of the engine, the transmission control module that controls the shifting of your transmission. Um, the engine performance is controlled by the engine control module, also controls the governmental admissions um, standards that we meet that could not be met with the old mechanical ways. So these are very critical, these modules and the chips are contained in the modules. Um, the chip and module numbers range differently from, from a mid-range truck. There's approximately 650 different electronic uh, electrical components in a vehicle, sensors, switches, et cetera. Approximately 30 of them are modules. Most of all the 651 components contain at least one chip. The 30 modules have a much more complicated architecture, as you can see in the picture, Senator, each containing multi-semiconductor chips, some containing 100 plus chips. 650 is an average um, component number, but varies with the different building depending on your, on your uh, naturally your options, whatever. Um, uh, these dependency on semiconductor chips is actually, uh, from talking to our engineers, is, is expected to double in the next three years. Um, so very important on, on what our, our dependency are on these things. The short of these chips causes the company to make hard decisions determining where the limited supplies they receive go. Um, do they send them to a car assembly or a truck and SUV assembly? And what options can be eliminated or installed at a later date? Adding options later re leads to extra costs and the lack of product availability leads to customer dissatisfaction. One of the last pictures I will show you is uh, my wife just purchased a brand new Tahoe vehicle. Um, as you can see, as I, high, high, as I have highlighted, there's a credit, not equipped with heated steering wheel, includes later retrofit. Credit, not equipped with front and rear park assist, includes later retrofit. So these are something that will have to be taken back to the dealership where somebody will have to spend hours in, in, in 
putting these modules into the vehicle, loading them up to a computer, talking to the vehicle's computer, and so now the computer recognizes these. Um, where, this, where this button is on your steering wheel for your heated steering wheel is a blank spot. So that whole mechanism would have to be changed, which in turn costs money and uh, takes away from a company's profit, which in turn shares with their, with their, in our case, our employees, which then turns around to be money out into, the, into our community and taxpayers. At Flint Truck Assembly, we build about 1,000 trucks a day. Every single one that's being built as we set here today, along with the ones that will be built next week, next month and beyond, there's someone waiting on that truck. Although we are able to produce the trucks, many which have already been built, they're waiting on the chips and modules to be arrived and installed and then delivered to the dealership. Chip shorting has continued to affect customer demands, the inability to produce certain vehicles. I'll give you an example of the Equinox. When General Motors decided to take the chips from the Equinox to move them to the truck and SUV assembly, it leads to idle plants and workers not earning expendable income, income that gets back into our economy. All this is proof that we need to build these chips right here in the United States of America where we control the quality and are not held hostage by a foreign companies or delivery issues when somebody makes a wrong turn in a canal. We need to build here with proud Americans that after the birth of the automakers, UAW in 1937, and Senator, you referenced um, how we were able to convert our factories to make ventilators and masks and, and PPEs and that type of stuff. Right after 1937 and the birth of UAW, um, we also turned our factories and facilities in, into mass production of military planes, tanks, weapons, and other essential military products that had never been done in Americans' history before, mass producing, producing of these uh, military um, supplies. Um, we were supplying those who were defending our freedom in World War II, um, a country where today the hardworking men and women take a box of bolt and a raw sheet metal and build the highest quality of vehicles around the globe. A country that is willing and ready to produce the next generation of vehicles, but they wanna do it here. They want to do it right here where we live and play. Right here, the place we love, the good old USA. Mr. Senator, we stand ready, able, and with unlimited time-tested talent. Let's build chips here, as well as the current technology and future technology. Let's do it here. Let's do it in our house. Thank you again, Senator Peters, for the most honorable opportunity to be here with you and all the rest of the panel and you folks. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Oz. Uh, the, uh, the, the photographs uh, that you referenced uh, in, uh, in your uh, opening statement uh, will be without objection uh, entered into the record uh, as well. Our uh, next witness today is uh, Mr. Garrett Francis, uh, Vice President of Federal Affairs uh, at the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, also known as uh, Auto Innovators. Mr. Francis joined the Auto Innovators in January of 2021. He leads the Federal Affairs team that serves as a liaison for the automotive in industry to both policymakers uh, and to Congress as a whole. Uh, Mr. Francis brings over 30 years of experience working in the transportation sector and other industries. Mr. Francis, welcome to the subcommittee. Uh, you may proceed with your opening comments. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, Chairman Peters, on behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation and our members, I thank you for the opportunity to appear at this hearing today to share my perspective on how the auto industry in the U.S. is at the forefront of innovation and the importance of a robust and resilient supply chain that enhances U.S. competitiveness. We appreciate continued engagement with your office regarding the ongoing challenges in the semiconductor supply chain to develop supportive policies that can help ease those constraints and develop further domestic production capacity, including fully funding the authorized program from the Chips for America Act as accomplished in legislation in both chambers, including the Bipartisan United States Innovation Competitiveness Act, or USICA. Maintaining and enhancing U.S. leadership in automotive innovation, however, is not just about the future of the auto industry. It is about the nation's global competitiveness and economic security. Nations that lead the development and adoption of innovative technologies, such as electrification, connectivity, and automation, as you referenced, will also shape supply chains, define global standards, and potentially reshape the international marketplace. 
Uh, Senator, you mentioned the transformation and the role that Michigan played in the auto industry. Today, we're on the verge of another transformation in the automotive industry in the United States that will fundamentally alter personal mobility. Through substantial long-term investments in electrification, as well as advanced safety technologies, including automation, the industry is redefining motor vehicle transportation. Likewise, government policies, investments, and programs must be modernized and transformed to reflect changes in the global marketplace and gaps in its supply chain. Globally, the automotive industry annually invests more than $125 billion in research and development, $20 billion more than the software and internet technology industry. Roughly 24 billion of this annual investment occurs in the US, which supports alone 108,000 jobs and harnesses the innovation and ingenuity of major automakers and their workforce. Despite the industry's resiliency over the past two years, there's no question that lingering uncertainties associated with the COVID-19 public health emergency, along with recent global conflicts and other disruptions will continue to stress supply chains and influence consumer trends further straining the capital resources necessary to invest in future technology development. At a time when demand for semiconductors will continue to increase across all sectors, the auto industry represents one of the fastest and most substantial growth sectors for the semiconductor industry. As mentioned, semiconductors are used in a wide and growing variety of automotive electronic components that perform vital functions, vehicle control, safety, emissions, driver information, and others. The transformations underway across the auto industry are driving increased demand in the number and variety of semiconductors necessary for automotive production. Expanding and securing critical supply chains while developing new ones is a key factor in whether the U.S. will remain a leader in automotive innovation. Currently, the auto industry is facing substantial production losses stemming from capacity challenges across the semiconductor supply chain. Semiconductors, of course, are just one example of the type of investments needed to support U.S. leadership and job growth. But the challenges and opportunities before us are bigger than any one component part, policy, branch, level of government, or industry sector. For the U.S. to remain a leader in the development and adoption of transformational automotive technologies, we need a comprehensive national vision and strategy rooted in economic, social, environmental, and cultural realities. That comprehensive strategy must address several pertinent and pressing questions. What supply chains are available and will they need to change? What are the challenges to developing the U.S. supply base for specific new technologies? Senator, how are we preparing or repositioning the U.S. workforce, including auto workers, suppliers, and related workers for these new technologies? What are the impediments to consumer adoption and affordability of advanced vehicle technologies, including electrification and automation? How do we address the challenges and barriers unique to certain communities, such as rural and disadvantaged, and ensure advanced vehicle technologies are accessible and beneficial for all Americans? What other industries, stakeholders, or sectors will be necessary to realize the potential of these important transformations? These are but a few challenging questions at the core of maintaining U.S. competitiveness and enhancing U.S. leadership in automotive innovation. Strategies must account for these realities, otherwise they could inadvertently harm the nation's workforce, limit consumer options, and jeopardize our nation's future and global competitiveness. Our goal, Senator, in working with you is to avoid such outcomes by continuing to work collaboratively with policymakers and other stakeholders to maintain the U.S.'s global leadership in automotive innovation. So today, on behalf of the auto innovators and our member companies, I look forward to working with you, other members of Congress, and the administration to develop and implement policies such as those being discussed today to realize the promise of cleaner, safer, smarter transportation future while ensuring the U.S. leads automotive innovation for generations to come. So again, I appreciate being here today. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Francis, for, for your opening uh, comments. Our, our next uh, witness today is Mr. Jay Rathard. Uh, Mr. Rathard has been with KLA for 26 years. And among uh, other roles, he is uh, the co-creator and owner of company-wide uh, automotive, uh, automotive strategy uh, for KLA. Before joining KLA, he was a Top Gun trained and decorated uh, F-14 uh, fighter pilot, 
uh, go Navy. Uh, and uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Rathard. Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, service to our country. You may proceed with your comments. Thank you, Senator Peters. On behalf of KLA, it's an honor to be here to address the hearing and the other, uh, the other committee members and online and those who are testifying. Nearly all of us carry a tech technology miracle with us practically everywhere we go without giving another thought. Uh, more than 7 billion smartphones are in use today, and each is loaded with a few dozen of the most advanced chips ever designed. Inside those chips are incomprehensibly small transistors that allow it to do its many functions. And the continuous march of chip technology, known as Moore's Law, has shrunk these transistors to the point that 150 million of them will fit into the period at the end of a sentence. A chip that is the brains of your smartphone is about the size of a postage stamp, and it has 12 billion of these transistors in it by itself. KLA is a quality-focused company, and our role, simply put, is to help chip manufacturers everywhere ensure that individual transistors that power chips function as designed when manufactured and reliably do, do so day after day. The technology that KLA brings has enabled to advance the entire semiconductor industry for more than 45 years. We're the third largest semiconductor equipment company in the US and our equipment is in every chip fab worldwide. These same chips are now incorporated into many products, including automobiles, enabling innovations like driver assistance features, electrification, and the autonomy that we're addressing today that appeal to today's drivers. But many are surprised to learn that premium cars may contain not just a few dozen chips, but the premium cars are now up to as many as 10,000 individual chips. And when I started this just a few years ago, we used to say nearly 3,000. So it's, it's tripled in just a few years at the premium level. A growing percentage of these advanced chips are central to the operation of the vehicle, uh, serving in either mission critical or safety critical roles. And when a chip fails in your phone after a few years, it's a frustrating inconvenience. But when a chip fails in a car, it can be catastrophic and only bad for business or brand reputation if you put lives at stake. So KLA believes in the growth and the importance of chips and automobiles, and it's a secular significant shift, and that our quality role will be crucial to its success. In recognition of this trend, KLA has built a second headquarters campus here in Michigan to be close to the heartbeat of America's automotive industry and to collaborate with the community of local car manufacturers, suppliers, and academics that are bringing innovation to this market. As part of the Good Jobs for Michigan program, our move here was conceived in partnership with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation and approved by the Michigan Strategic Fund. And we're, plan we're proud of our plan to bring 600 new high-tech jobs here to the region. The forces that power the semiconductor industry's success are access to a talented and creative workforce, a fair and hospitable business environment, and an ongoing commitment to an investment in R&D. And as the transistors shrink further to three nanometers and below, the technical challenges continue to grow harder for everyone across the industry. Innovation and collaboration across the supply chain are crucial. While the US currently maintains leadership in many sectors that support semiconductors, sadly, America's share of global chip manufacturing has fallen to just 12%, down from 37% in 1990. Nearly three quarters of chips are now built in Asia, including all of the most advanced ones found in your phone and in your car, as well as an increasing share that power the internet, cellular networks, cloud computing, and AI. Many of these chips are designed here at home, but all are built overseas by two major contract manufacturers known as foundries. Each of these are susceptible to unplanned disruption, either from natural disasters or geopolitical events, creating a significant strategic liability for America and our economy and our jobs here at home. In the past, America had multiple domestic chip manufacturers vying for technology leadership. Most fell behind on the necessary investment to remain technically competitive and therefore profitable, and this caused them to change their strategies away from the cutting edge, leaving only one viable U.S. supplier position to potentially serve this market and compete here at home against the entrenched foundry leaders overseas. The importance in R&D investment to stay relevant and competitive in this rapidly evolving business cannot be overstated. Furthermore, the capital build even one five nanometer chip can exceed $15 billion. Tax policy and incentives are often the key factors in determining where and when these factories are built. KLA's business is worldwide but we support efforts to increase competition in the chip industry and to reshore advanced manufacturing and, and foundry production in America. Investments like the CHIPS Act enable America to advance our competitive differentiation and reinforce the strength of domestic semiconductor businesses ecosystem. Therefore, we support the $52 billion in public funding of the CHIPS Act 
to supplement the $70 billion in private capital the industry already invests in R&D each year and the $150 billion in CapEx the broader industry will spend. But long-term change requires a long-term view. As such, we also support concepts like the FABS Act to provide ongoing tax credits for R&D investments that will encourage the growth of our domestic manufacturing base and create a positive economic ripple across the economy. We also support programs that focus on STEM education to develop the best and brightest workers here at home, as well as those that allow us to attract and retain the best in global talent. At KLA, our motto is keep looking ahead, reflecting our focus on enabling the advance of semiconductor technology. And we're grateful to those in the US Congress, like you, Senator Peters, and the state of Michigan who share this view and who support this strategic industry. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rathard. Um, our last witness uh, today is Mr. Glenn Stevens, Executive Director of Mish Auto and Vice President of Automotive and Mobility Initiatives at the Detroit Regional Chamber. Mr. Stephen hold, Mr. Stevens uh, holds, uh, Mish, uh, leads Mish Auto, the voice and convening body for Michigan to address key industry issues for talent, uh, advocacy, and awareness. Mr. Stevens has more than 25 years of experience across the automotive steel special equipment uh, industries. Uh, he's a proud Michigander, a graduate of uh, Michigan State University. Go green. And uh, <laughs> welcome, Mr. Stevens. You may proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you. Well, I've never followed a Top Gun before, so I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Um, welcome to the Detroit Regional Chamber. It's a pleasure and honor to have you, Senator Peters, uh, members of the subcommittee and fellow industry peers. We're Lucky enough to have uh, Ford, Stellantis, Benzo, Foley, Dunamis Energy, the MEDC, and Automation Alley. I hope I didn't forget you, but thank you for being part of our community here. Uh, as you know, we've submitted written testimony, but I, I would uh, also like to add that to pick up on Mr. Dawes' comment, this weekend, driving around uh, Metro Detroit, uh, two things stood out to me. One is the number of parked vehicles that are sitting waiting for chips or completion of semi conductor components, and they are everywhere. Um, uh, new vehicles, vehicles that are important to these customers. And the second thing, as many of you know, when you pass an auto dealership, it looks quite different than we're used to it. There are virtually no vehicles on those lots, and it's very difficult to buy a new vehicle. With those things in mind, uh, please allow me to express the following to frame things. The United States, and particularly Michigan, remains at the forefront of automobility innovation and production. The Great Lakes region is number one in automotive manufacturing jobs. The Great Lakes states investment in R&D outpaces the rest of the nation. And Michigan represents 18% of all US vehicle production. However, as both the COVID pandemic, uh, the week long closure of the Ambassador Bridge in early February, Russia's recent invasion of the Ukraine, another earthquake, unfortunately in Japan, there are clear episodes of instability that transcend national borders and also have painful impacts on the global supply chain and Michigan's signature industry. As this committee knows, the current shortage of semiconductors has hampered the auto industry's ability to build and sell vehicles. The vehicle industry now considers them unrecoverable. And in Michigan alone, we're approaching 300,000 vehicles last year, uh, 2.3 million in the United States uh, compared to 1 million in China. There is no silver bullet to this issue. In fact, I'm sure Mr. Ford would have something to say about the supply chain efficiency and resiliency if he were here with us today. But currently a disproportionate number of these chips are manufactured away from our shores and other countries install US production. And it illustrates the problematic nature of relying on these foreign suppliers. Therefore, our elected labor and industry leaders must prioritize building a more resilient domestic supply chain. Intel's announcement in Ohio is a perfect, great step. Arizona's announcements with, with regards to it, hopefully in Michigan, we will have plants like that here in the future. We urge the uh, lawmakers and the community to further extend and commit the uh, approval of the CHIPS Act, but also the FABS Act, the Investing in Domestic Semiconductor Manufacturing Act, and the Securing Semiconductor Supply Chain Act. All of these are complementary and bipartisan pieces of legislation that demonstrate from what my colleagues from industry and labor have shown that building this technology in the United States isn't just good for business and the American worker, it's sound public policy. Investing more in domestic chips means expanding not just the number of manufacturing jobs, but also high tech jobs. These facilities are often called labs to fab, 
and there are amount there are a tremendous amount of high tech workers, skilled trade workers, and production workers available in these facilities for our American workers. We see this as both a, something that represents good, high paying jobs, but will also require a sophisticated talent strategy here in Michigan and the rest of the country to support that. This is something that we at Michauto and the Detroit Regional Chamber are very committed to. Speaking of AVs, we also would like to ensure that the Senate also would provide the AV Start Act, first introduced by yourself, Senator Peters and Thune. We believe this legislation is highly needed and we hope that we'll anticipate that again in the future and look forward to supporting it. Finally, in order to ensure that the leaders in this technology and other mobility innovation remain here, we also need high skilled and high tech talent workers from other places around the country, but other countries. So we would also encourage lawmakers to sharpen this competitive edge by taking up the bipartisan immigration legislation currently in the House of Representatives. The Fairness for High Skilled Immigrants Act would remove arbitrary per country caps on the number of high skilled foreign workers that could come to the United States. In closing, Michigan, the birthplace of the automobility industry, remains globally competitive as a leader in the automobile sector. The industry employs over 1.1 people directly and indirectly in our state and contributes over $300 billion of economy to our state every year. It continues to draw significant foreign and domestic investment. We welcome KLA to our community and they've been a great citizen and we'd like to see more of that type of company here in Michigan. We hope that here in our state, our administration of policymakers will prioritize the domestic sourcing of these production and also the high skilled talent factor in research design engineering centers across our state and country. Policymakers would therefore be wise not to let the past success of the American auto industry lull us into a false sense that we will continue to and enjoy success in the future. We need our leaders from Capitol Hill to the C-suite to the Union Hall to come together, champion and enact the type of future oriented legislation I talked about today. We all have talked about today. These bipartisan pieces of legislation are our chance to secure America and Michigan's position as a dominant leader in automotive and mobility manufacturing and innovation for the future. We shouldn't pass this opportunity up. Thank you, Senator Peters and to my peers. Really appreciate the opportunity today. Well, thank you, Mr. Stevens and to each of our witnesses. Thank you uh, for, uh, for your opening uh, remarks. Uh, Mr. Dawes, uh, certainly the, the, the public has seen an awful lot of media attention uh, to the chip shortage and the impact that it's had on the auto industry, but uh, your folks uh, have experienced it uh, firsthand uh, as a result of uh, layoffs uh, and changes uh, to try to adapt uh, to the, the, the shortages. That's why Senator Stabenow and I secured $2 billion uh, in the Senate passed competitiveness bill to manufacture the uh, so-called uh, mature legacy chips uh, here in Michigan that are used uh, by automobiles. Uh, this is in addition to the $50 billion that's in the package to include research and development as well as manufacturing for uh, advanced uh, semiconductors. But my question for you, sir, is can you describe the, the human impact of the chip shortage and tell the committee how it affected not only auto workers, uh, but also communities in Michigan and across the, the country? Well, it's it's a it's a devastating effect because you know as we've all lived through this pandemic, we you know we we are social people. We like to be out in public. We like to go to ball games, and we like to go to work. We like to go to work and proudly build the vehicles that we build in this state and this country um, to the point where it, they are the best built and reliable vehicles in the globe, and. Um, when that gets restricted and, and you are told, hey, we're shutting your facility down for weeks and weeks and weeks, only due to a lack of parts, that's a very devastating for uh, a person to want, that wants to come to work and make a living and provide for his family and, and pay their fair share of taxes. So it has had a huge um, effect. And, and especially when you can relate it to something that's in our grasp something that we could be doing, something that we could that we could be building right here in, in, in the United States. And more importantly, in my opinion, Michigan, two of the main components that um, you need to build semiconductor chips are electricity and water. And how ironically, as I sit here and say that, looking out over this, one, one of them we have plenty of. Nobody else has what we have. 
And there's, so there's no better argument and no better place to build it than right here in Michigan. Yeah, absolutely. You talked about uh, in our grasp and acting, and I think all of uh, the witnesses have mentioned uh, legislation before Congress to address this issue. So my question to you again, uh, Mr. Oz, is uh, if we don't pass this legislation, what, what signal is that sending to auto workers and working people across the country if we don't pass this legislation? Well, I think the signal is that, you know, as Americans, as working men and women of this great country, is we go to work every day and we do our fair share and we expect a fair day's pay and uh, we're willing. So we're able, we have time tested talent um, as history has shown that we can do it. We're willing to do it. We stand ready and the roadblock, if it's, if it's our legislative process that puts the roadblock into the men and women that want to come to work and make a fair day's wage so they can go and pay their fair share of taxes to keep this country going, that is absolutely devastating that something like that could hinder and put a roadblock in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rather, did, uh, in November, uh, Michigan was uh, proud uh, to welcome uh, KLA uh, to Ann Arbor, where the company opened its uh, second uh, headquarters, uh, especially considering how clear it's become that the semiconductor industry is absolutely essential to our auto industry and, uh, and really the entire modern economy for, uh, for that point. Uh, in Michigan, we make things, and uh, while we're known for making cars, our engineers and our workers have the skills and talent to develop a wide range of cutting-edge uh, technology like KLA semiconductor manufacturing tools. Uh, of course, Michigan uh, has so much uh, to offer that uh, makes it, a, I think, a top destination for innovators uh, like KLA, and you demonstrated that uh, with your selection to locate here. Well, my question for you is, um, sir, is can you discuss KLA's selection process that culminated with choosing Ann Arbor uh, for your second headquarters, and can you pinpoint some of the reasons why Michigan is where KLA wants to be? Yes, sir. Yes, Senator. So. KLA started out as a Silicon Valley company, but we're now a Michigan company. Our new headquarters opened here in Ann Arbor, as the center mentioned it last fall, and we already have 400 new hires at that site. And I checked our website before the meeting today, and we have 200 recs open now. So if you love high tech, <laughs> come be one of us. Um, we've invested $195 million so far, and our new campus is adjacent to the University of Michigan. We looked at hundreds of sites before we picked Michigan. But we were drawn by engineer by the strong engineering talent here. And I'd heard your comments before. Michigan builds things. Absolutely, that's why we're here. Uh, our partnership with the University of Michigan Engineering School will help be a, a feeder for the kind of talent we need to build these complex systems. We like your international access uh, with your airport here. Easy to get to Asia and Europe where our customers are. We had a great partnership with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. And most importantly, as we went searching, Michiganders had a can-do and how can we help attitude. And we didn't encounter that everywhere. So you made us feel welcome. We're happy to be here. We continue to want to grow here. Uh, and furthermore, in my experience, where chip companies land, things tend to cluster up. I think about, I think about Austin and Chandler, Arizona, Portland, San Jose. So I think when the secret gets out, maybe more like-minded uh, high-tech companies will join us. Well, well thank you for that uh, the answer. I'm going to ask a, a few of you uh, some questions uh, here related to uh, autonomous vehicles, which uh, represent uh, the, the future for the auto industry. And certainly while the exact uh, timing and the details are going to be uh, influenced by both technological factors as well as uh, economic uh, factors, one way or another, cars will ultimately be autonomous, and there are already autonomous vehicles on our roads in various parts of our country. And I think uh, that, uh, quite frankly, is really good news, uh, especially in light of the tremendous uh, safety benefits uh, that these uh, automobiles are going to deliver. And I cited some figures uh, in my opening comment uh, that uh, really scream out for change when you're talking about the lives of tens of thousands uh, of Americans who, who die on our highways every year. So, Mr. Mr. Rather, uh, again, back to you. Could, could you share some more details with this uh, subcommittee on how semiconductor chips will play a role in uh, making autonomous vehicles a reality? Yes, Senator. So many of the chips that are in your vehicles today have been in the supply chain for a long time, and the quality has been well-tested, well-proven. Qualified chips might be in the supply chain as long as 15 years. 
So there's lots of opportunity to assure that chips in critical roles will be reliable. I think the concern as we push into these advanced capabilities like autonomous driving, we're gonna bring some technology and some very advanced chips, maybe from the consumer space that haven't had that long time to mature. And we're gonna ask them to perform functions that will be mission critical and safety critical. We're gonna put our, our families in those cars and we're gonna want those chips to perform reliably. Now this is KLA's core mission and it's why we're so interested in working closely with the automotive sector, with the OEMs, with the tier ones, to help them understand the nuances of chip quality, how to make sure that all those new devices, which there may be thousands interacting with each other and need to do so flawlessly, we wanna make sure that, that that goes well, protects the lives that it's intended to. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Francis, uh, my, my question um, um, for you also follows uh, along with, uh, with autonomous vehicles here. Uh, in my mind, uh, we are going to have autonomous, uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, as we mentioned. Uh, the only question is, will the United States uh, and its allies actually lead the way in developing this, this uh, technology, or, or are we going to cede this advantage uh, to other nations uh, like China? So my question to you, sir, is can you comment on the importance of maintaining our competitive advantage when it comes to autonomous vehicles, as well as related uh, essential technologies like artificial intelligence? Um, certainly, and thank you for that, that question, Senator. Um, you know, the American auto companies and auto companies that produce here have invested billions of dollars in research and development in autonomous vehicles. One of the things that Mr. Rashford mentioned is, is that, you know, these are going to take time to mature, but good public policy will also make sure that we do it safely and we do it smartly. Um, you know, we need our companies to have the opportunity to test and deploy so that these things can be tested in, in real conditions. And so, you know, as we look to the future, our uh, and competitiveness, um, foreign nations are already investing uh, in this technology. And so we in the United States need to make sure that we are, our public policy is keeping pace with that uh, global investment. Uh, at the Auto Innovators, we've developed an AV roadmap that lays out a clear four-year plan for policymakers to preserve and enhance U.S. leadership in autonomous vehicle and autonomous technology development um, for life-saving technologies. And we need to look at it that way. Autonomous vehicles offer a great opportunity for people around the country, whether it's in rural areas or disadvantaged areas or have mobility challenges. And, and, it, and, it, and as I mentioned before, in the auto industry, a number of things that, are, that happen in the auto industry and that happen here in Michigan find their way into other things defense industry benefits, uh, education industry benefits, medical industry benefits. So our supply chains that are so vital and so important to Michigan and to autonomous vehicles um, are connected across the spectrum of U.S. manufacturing. So uh, your leadership in, in talking about how to move that conversation forward uh, in terms of AV and your bipartisan work uh, to try and find a way to encourage uh, public policies that do just that will continue to be very critical. All right, thank you. So Mr. Dawson, we're talking about uh, these changes. My question uh, for you, sir, is uh, uh, what are you seeing in terms of deployment of these technologies uh, play out actually in the, in the factories, uh, on the shop floor, and, and specifically, uh, how has making cars uh, changed over the years uh, as you've watched it uh, with respect to chips? And, and where do you see things heading when it comes uh, to workers? Well, as I said earlier, the, the difference in the modern vehicle what what a vehicle was when i grew up is uh, totally different you open the hood of a vehicle today versus just a few years ago you you look in there and you'd see the steering shaft come out going down to the steering box and and, and now all that is is a clump of wires coming out that, that does that performs all of that so that's that's a, a, a big part of how manufacturing has changed today and quite frankly um those of us we included years ago that were, were uh, reluctant to that change, maybe, uh, or, or, or afraid of that change. Now enjoy that change. Uh, I love my heated steering wheel. I love the Michigan. I love my heated seats in Michigan. And everyone in here has got something either on their hip or their pocket or laying on the table. As Mr. Rothart said, is that who would have believed years ago what that cell phone would, would do? I, mean, I remember I had a bag phone. And look at what it does, to, what it does today. So there's a huge shift in, in, in how we manufacture and what the functions of the vehicles and, and how they're performed more so than the functions. 
So, so that's a that's a big um, a big change. Um, what we see uh, one of the other major changes is when you remove the internal internal combustion engine along with the transmission as we know it today, and, and then the drive shaft into the rear axle. Um, that's that's a significant change that will be taken over with with electrical components, but. Approximately today, 80% of the vehicle remains unchanged. Um, you still have your, your, you still have all your interior, your steering wheels, your, your, your um, uh, brake pedals, your seats, your, your heating, your air conditioning. Outside, you still got your sheet metal. You still got your tires and, and, and what have you. And then, and then the frame structure. You know, all of that, whether it's whether it's it's you know propelled with an internal combustion engine or electric uh, uh, motor. You still have all the safety features, uh, crash specifications, and what have you. All of them safety features that still need to maintain. So about eighty percent of the vehicle remains unchanged. So them are some of the things that uh, you know are naturally on our radar. And I got to tell you, um, I'm a GM guy. Um, I don't have any Ford or, or Stellantis in my region. I have all General Motors, but I can tell you, with working with our General Motors um, counterparts and the in the in the design and the um, engineering and the, and the management level along with our membership and our and our leadership in our in our factories we launch vehicles like have never been launched with the quality and time frame that have never been done in the history of this country and I and I give that that uh, um, accolades to the management and the, and the union and working together and we look forward to these these uh, future changes. Um, they're a part of our lives. We do them every day. And um, uh, as I said earlier, we stand willing and ready. Right. I'm going to want to return uh, in a moment uh, to electrification, labor uh, issues, um, uh, and uh, talent development, uh, et cetera. But before I do that, I want to return to the, the current chip uh, shortage for a moment. Uh, and my question is going to be for you, Mr. Stevens. Uh, you know, when, when it comes to uh, chip shortage, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, the, the public is aware of the impact that it has on, on uh, auto uh, production, uh, but uh, they aren't necessarily aware of the very long supply chain that uh, gets uh, to that uh, auto product, uh, production. It's very complex, numerous players. So when auto production is disrupted, it doesn't just affect the major automakers, uh, which uh, people are familiar with. It involves numerous suppliers, businesses, many of which are small businesses that are involved in every step of auto production and countless workers all along that chain. And that's why I believe it's so important that we fund the CHIPS Act and the, the $2 billion investment uh, in legacy chips, as I've already mentioned. Uh, not only will manufacturing chips in America create numerous good paying jobs in the semiconductor industry, but it's gonna protect and grow jobs all through manufacturing sector. And so my question for you, sir, is can you describe the ripple effects uh, that the chip shortage uh, has caused throughout the auto supply chain? And if you could comment on, on what funding the CHIPS Act will mean to workers and businesses all up and down uh, that chain uh, and why we need to take action on it. Certainly, well, we'll, we'll focus on Michigan, which we, we do well. Um, so the auto industry is in virtually every community in Michigan virtually every single community. And we'll see it uh, very clearly in an assembly plant, but you don't see it so much as you go down into the lower tier uh, companies. And those lower tier companies, which might employ 10 people, 60 people, uh, all the way up to 6,000 people, they are what contributes to local communities, local economies. Uh, and there's an indirect uh, multiplier effect in each one of those communities. So when there is disruption, uh, for example, the, the two weeks down of the General Motors plant, you can imagine what that does to the local community on a daily basis. And when that stacks up, like it has stacked up over the last couple of years with the supply of the microchips and the problems, it has had an exponential factor on our communities. So the localization uh, and the investment in our own country of stabilizing and making that supply chain more resilient. So those peaks and valleys of production are not seen. Uh, these plants require stability, but so do the communities to operate. So we're hopeful as we see these investments in the United States that we'll, cite, we'll start to see even more growth in those economies and certainly not the dramatic impact that these economies feel in these local communities as well as the large cities. Right. Thank you. The, um, Mr. Rathard, uh, or, uh, a question for you, and uh, this uh, turns us back to 
uh, the electrification of the fleet, which we've been talking about, and and uh, how innovative semiconductor technologies are, are going to help reduce uh, charging times as well as uh, increase battery range, which is critical for for this transition uh, to occur. Uh, not only will it benefit the environment by reducing emissions, which is a, is a huge benefit, uh, but it will also uh, end our need to rely on gas to power our vehicles and remove a, really a major transportation cost, uh, as well as uh, we see potential national security issues uh, for around the world. So my question to you, sir, is can you talk about how semiconductors are going to help it, uh, it, uh, enhance EVs and make uh, a fully electric uh, future truly possible? Yes, Senator. So EVs are different from your standard combustion engine automobile and the fact that chip content is nearly three times what you would find in your standard automobile. And a lot of those chips are coming from a technology that has been used, and it's called silicon carbide. It's, it's actually been used in a lot of use cases before, but now we're bringing it into the, uh, our automobiles and it's handling this battery management, fast charging, uh, lots of the capabilities that make EVs possible. And we've really never stress tested it the way silicon's been tested for the last 70 years. So there's a lot of maturing going on in that part of the economy right now. I was uh, in North Carolina this last week, um, working with a company to try and improve the kind of necessary quality they're gonna need to, to deliver silicon carbide. So uh, I think there's lots of people interested in that. It'll power your vehicles into the future and bring the sorts of capabilities that we're all interested in, this additional safety, this uh, reduction of greenhouse gases, all the productivity gains we hope to get. To get so. Very good. Thank you. Ms. Francis, um, could you expand a little bit on uh, how you believe and your organization believes uh, electrification is going to literally transform mobility in the future? Um, certainly, Senator. I mean, as we look at it, our members, uh, our, our automakers and our suppliers are investing, have announced hundreds of billion dollars of investment in moving towards electrification. And they've done that because it's what the consumer wants. It's what the consumer sees as the future. And so as we look to it, um, you know, we see a couple of things, both supply side and demand side. And working with the government, there are a number of necessary conditions for the success of this transformation. The technology is there, and we're continuing to build on that technology. Our members are, have, have announced more than almost 150 new models of EVs in the next several years to be available to consumers at all price points. And so the market is rich. The market is developing. Um, but I think one of the things we're looking at, as Mr. Rutherford said, is that as these technologies mature, uh, we are focused on safety, <clears throat> we're focused on consumer adoption, we're focused on um, a number of advancements. And so the supply chain overall is extremely critical. And semiconductors are a major part of that. But it also, as I mentioned, there are a number of other things in the U.S. supply chain in terms of a robust, resilient supply chain we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at uh, critical minerals. We need to be looking at uh, those production capabilities and how we can do it uh, in the U.S. in a smart and environmentally sensitive way. So uh, there are a number of components to it, but our members, as I mentioned, are, are all in. Uh, they're dedicated to this cleaner, safer, smarter transportation future and, and electric vehicles, including, you know, battery electric and, and PHEVs and a number of things all fit into that. And so it's a it's a it's a risk robust growing market for for our folks and i think again it's it's what consumers are telling us they want mm -hmm. yeah very good mr stevens um uh, we uh, those of us uh, in michigan have uh, seen many transformations uh, through the auto industry uh through many many years uh, starting uh, back before our time with uh, henry ford uh, with the uh, with uh, what to be clear before our time um uh, that uh, brought the assembly line and the auto industry has been always very highly adaptive, uh, as well as uh, our auto workers who have been an in uh, integral part of all of that. And so now we're discussing some other transformative changes from electrification to, to, to automation. So uh, if you could talk a little bit about what trends uh, in the auto industry that we're talking about in the future, what that actually means uh, for Michigan, and more importantly, how can the state of Michigan actually harness them to create uh, an absolute New, enter, uh, new generation of opportunity here in our state? Yes, that's a great question. And to pick up on Mr. Dawes earlier when he said that 80% of the vehicle uh, remains the same, it does, but the nature of those components dramatically changes. So you have uh, the vehicle becoming a telecommunications provider. 
ultimately. So there is a technology stack with the vehicle that's occurring. And when you look at the other significant changes, we know it's the propulsion system. But it's not just the propulsion system that's changing because we have traditionally focused on the industry when you look at design, engineering, and manufacturing. Now there's two things in front of it and before it. That's the grid and the infrastructure that supports electrification and recyclability. Recyclability has always been important to the industry, but now it becomes critical, particularly because of the critical minerals. We need to bring them back to the front of the process. So the economic opportunity, when you look at all four of these major areas with regards to telecommunications and software and electrification, it's a tremendous opportunity for Michigan. Um, we are working very closely with the governor's administration and the legislature right now. I can very honestly and safely say that we're real pleased with the progress that's being made. There is an incredible focus right now on all four of those areas and specifically be that focuses on talent, because there's going to be requirements for talent in this transition that we don't currently have or we're not generating enough of. So the economic opportunity of the industry as it transforms is one thing, and the talent opportunity and building a more diverse and inclusive workforce along the way is something that everybody, everybody is committed to. I think we're going on the, in the right direction. The MEDC has got a new strategy, a new leadership, and it's got a new organization. We're very pleased by what we see. And so we're, we're, we're on the right path right now. Well, well thank you, uh, Mr. Stevens. Um, uh, Mr. Dawes, uh, as was discussed, uh, the issue of talent and the ability to make things uh, is gonna be critical for the future of uh, Michigan. And uh, in, uh, in your read, written testimony, uh, you mentioned that Michigan is uh, the ideal location to grow domestic manufacturing because our workers are ready and quote, have unlimited time-tested uh, talent uh, to offer. And uh, in the coming years, uh, it won't be just auto manufacturing, it's gonna be all sorts of advanced manufacturing, which will represent uh, the future. Uh, certainly the semiconductor industry is a prime example of that future uh, and the need for, for folks who understand how to make, uh, make things. Uh, if Congress passes the CHIPS Act, our country is gonna start building lots of chip manufacturing plants. Uh, and there certainly is a concern out there as to whether or not we're going to have workers uh, to to fill those roles in this uh, new these new manufacturing plants, so my question to you, sir, is: Can you talk about the kind of training and skills that Michiganders develop by working in the auto industry now uh, or in other manufacturing settings, and how this demonstrates that we have the workforce that is ready to fill the needs for the semiconductor manufacturing industry as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, I can proudly sit here and tell you that. Um, I spent a lot of years working in the factory and um, representing workers. And I can tell you through our joint programs with the big three and which actually uh, 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 filters down into our independent parts suppliers and our technical office professionals is we take safety at the highest level and that gets um, trained. Everybody gets trained along with um, the different um, areas of um, uh, assembly, repair, um, uh, installation of equipment um, in a skilled trade department, whether they're, whether they're trained to bend pipe to pull wire or to work on modicons or, or programming. Um, so much of our, of our assembly equipment or our paint departments or whatever. So internally, we focus a lot on training and bringing people up to the next level so that when the, when the new process comes in, they um, are trained and that they um, understand the process. And as a process moves forward, we continue to send them vehicles out the door at the highest quality. One prime example is in, in Flint, Michigan, we um, lobbied for a lot of years with General Motors and General Motors invested in a brand new paint shop for the Flint truck assembly, which went from um, um, you know, lacquer base and, and, and uh, that type of paints to water-based paint and the sophistication and the um, pure technology that is in this place now is, um, is just, uh, it will blow your mind from what you used to see and what you, what you see today. And all of our folks were trained and spot ready when that equipment hit the floor, got bolted down and started running trucks. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mr. Uh, Rathard, um, I'd certainly like your commentary on this issue as well about 
some of the potential workforce synergies between uh, folks who are involved in auto production and uh, semiconductor production? Yes, Senator. Uh, semiconductor design and process engineering are, are engineering intensive. But when you walk inside a chip fab, the only thing that looks a little different is people are wearing these clean, clean room suits. Maybe you've seen pictures of this before. But ultimately, it's really manufacturing, writ at a very small scale, if you will. But there's still people moving materials, people controlling quality, uh, uh, smart trained workers bring these chips to life. And I think the skills that Michiganders have based on manufacturing automobiles and, and your rich manufacturing history in other areas are, are just the types of skills that can be transformed and to fit into the chip world, whether we're building the chips themselves, building the equipment that does it, building the factories that make the chips. Michiganders are, are well equipped with your long history of, of building things to be successful. Great, thank you. Mr. Stevens, as we've uh, discussed uh, the, the growth of the, the auto industry and the impact on the country and the fact that it created the, the American uh, middle, middle class, uh, uh, there's certainly been incredible opportunities uh, that have resulted uh, from the industry, but uh, all too often some communities uh, are left behind, especially uh, communities uh, of color. Uh, and as we look to the years ahead and think about shaping opportunities for water workers, uh, as well as uh, in the semiconductor industry, which are good paying uh, jobs uh, in manufacturing. I'd like uh, your thoughts on, on what uh, you're seeing in Michigan uh, on this front to have a very diversified uh, workforce and, and how uh, we can step up uh, this uh, important priority. Well, I think first of all, it's, a, it's extremely important and there is a focus on this that we raise the educational attainment of all of our people in this state. And that means something post high school. It could be a welding certificate, could be coding, could be an advanced degrees, but we need to raise that educational attainment level in Michigan. That's something that the Detroit Regional Chamber is very committed to. In addition to that, the K-12 base level education is important. But beyond that, all of our citizens, whether they work in industry 4.0 in the factory or they work on a connected vehicle, electric vehicle, they will need more digital skills. Every job classification's digital skill score or rating, according to the Brookings Institute, continues to go up. So this is really essential for us as we prepare people. But I also think that, and we're seeing this right now, and I think uh, Natalie's company with Dunamis Energy is a perfect example. Electrification, because of all of those different parts of the industry, provides an opportunity for more people to be participating in the economy of that electrification. And I think her company's a perfect example where they're going to build chargers here in Detroit. So we see these opportunities, but it's going to be incumbent upon us to prepare our, our, our youth with K through 12 to get the educational attainment and to get the right alignment of skills for the industry demand, whether it be in a labs to fabs, a semiconductor plant or a charging network plant or a traditional automotive plant. Thank you. Mr. Francis, I'd like you to, uh, to add uh, your perspective uh, from, the, uh, from automakers uh, on making the industry more diverse uh, and more inclusive. What's your assessment of where we are, what, we, what more we need to do going forward? Certainly, Senator. I think you know, I would say that as we look towards the future and we look at what the technology development can really do, um, Mr. Dawes held up an XM radio module. Mr. Rather held up his phone. Mr. Sievers talked about telecommunications. You talked about connectivity. And what I think this, uh, this transformation can do is it really is about connecting people. Uh, while automation is not new, the speed of automation has certainly increased. And so it's incumbent upon us and our members have taken to heart really looking at how communities are impacted, whether it's rural communities or disadvantaged communities or communities of color, both in terms of the workforce that they can attract uh, in these times and in terms of the consumers that they can service in these times. So I, I think it's, it's, it's not just on one side, but it's on all those sides. And I think that it's important that we continue to look at workforce training. It's, it's important we continue to look at um, informing our uh, young people about the path that they can take. Uh, you know, what are the opportunities that they might not have seen before? And so these are new things in this kind of new jobs in the U.S. economy. We've seen with this whole new burst of technology that you know, we've already seen new jobs and new skills uh, and for, for whatever skill level you might have. But I do think, as Mr. Steven said, it's important that we uh, that we begin to train our young people at an early age about the digital future, about the technology future, and retraining 
you know, we, we have, you know, in this country, we have people working longer than ever. Um, and we have people who are capable, uh, you know, well into their mature years, as we talk about mature nodes, um, that, you know, we do retraining that allows them to participate as well across the spectrum. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rathard, uh, as you know, the, the uh, Senate and the House have now both passed uh, separate bills to, to fund CHIPS Act, and uh, I'm hopeful uh, we'll get an agreement soon and we'll be able to uh, come together on a, on a fairly large package and send it off to the president to be uh, signed into law. Certainly, I believe it's essential uh, so that the federal government can start implementing uh, these incentives uh, and boost domestic manufacturing, which will help uh, everything we're talking about uh, here today. But I, I believe we can't act soon enough. Uh, statistics show that America's share of global semiconductor manufacturing has dropped from 37% to just 12% uh, percent, uh, today. And that puts our economy and as we've discussed, our national security uh, at risk. And as Congress works to finalize uh, this uh, in funding on this important question, um, I've also introduced a, a bipartisan bill called the Investing in Domestic Semiconductor Manufacturing Act. Uh, my bill would ensure that CHIPS Act incentivizes uh, gives incentives to boost domestic semiconductor manufacturing to include U.S. suppliers uh, that produce the materials uh, and the manufacturing equipment that enables uh, semiconductor manufacturing. And by growing the domestic uh, footprint of U.S. companies that produce essential materials and equipment, uh, we can create more opportunity for manufacturers here uh, in Michigan as well as uh, across the country, uh, certainly at the same time strengthening uh, all of those supply chains. So I'm glad that the House has uh, taken up uh, my language uh, and is in the bill. Uh, now we're hopeful to get it in the, the completed package going forward. But my question for you, sir, is can you discuss how incentivizing the domestic construction of facilities to produce materials and semiconductor manufacturing equipment is a key part of the solution to shore up the uh, supply chains in addition to building the facilities where the semiconductors are actually manufactured? Yes, Senator, and again, we're grateful to KLA for your leadership, <clears throat> as well as that of your colleagues and in the House in this uh, bicameral and bipartisan approach to the CHIPS Act and the surrounding supporting legislation. Uh, semiconductors are constantly evolving. There's new materials, new methods, new packaging. It's, it moves at a very rapid pace. One thing is constant, though, that it gets harder with each node. Um, each change brings new challenges, new obstacles, what we like to call defects, and that's KLA's business. We're there to help. We can't rest. We can't make a misstep, which is why we personally invest heavily in R&D, but we can always raise the bar higher. Uh, America's equipment manufacturers, KLA and our peer companies, do have foreign competitors. We want to ensure that this equipment business stays here in America, that we're able to uh, serve our domestic and overseas uh, suppliers that are important for alleviating this chip shortage. And we believe the CHIPS Act is an important part of that. Great, thank you. Well, Mr. Stevens, uh, um, companies uh, in Michigan are certainly uh, positioned to, to fill some of the, the void of uh, suppliers and the equipment manufacturers uh, and materials. Companies in Michigan, uh, like KLA, are a prime example who've uh, recently located here. Thank you again uh, for doing that. It's uh, wonderful to hear. Uh, we also have uh, Hemlock uh, Semiconductor uh, up uh, in, in Saginaw. So I think this is a uh, shows that we have some great opportunities to in increase uh, this type of business in our state. So my question for you is, uh, could you talk a little bit about how the CHIPS Act and my specific uh, proposal could support economic development uh, efforts uh, here uh, in Michigan uh, through both uh, the semiconductor industry as well as the auto industry really working together? Yes, it's, well, it's really important that we focus on what's needed for a company to make a decision to either grow the business that's already here or to come here. And of course, there's, mer there's a myriad of factors around that. The business climate's important, and there are a lot of things that go with the business climate. Um, the incentive climate's important. There's a lot of things that go with that too. Um, your specific legislation with regards to both funding from the act and also the supplemental of $2 billion to work with Select USA is extremely critical to let um, and enable economic development. And then, and really the critical factor is talent. So when Michigan looks at what it has and what it needs to do, these acts all help in their own way, but all complemented together as I referenced in my testimony to work together uh, to provide an opportunity for Michigan. So it puts us in the game because of our know-how from an engineering design manufacturing standpoint, but also because we innovate here. You know, there are more telecommunication patents that come out of this region than anywhere in the country, including mm -hmm. Silicon Valley. 
So there's a lot of innovation that goes on here too, but you know, we complement what you put forward and we hope it all becomes a reality because it will help Michigan. All right, thank you. Mr. Francis, um, I mentioned uh, in my, my opening remarks uh, how injuries and deaths on our roads uh, have been unfortunately rising. Uh, and considering that human error is the, usually the major factor uh, in those crashes, if we can uh, remove uh, the human driver, autonomous vehicles certainly hold uh, incredible promise uh, one day to significantly reduce uh, these injuries and deaths. But uh, it's certainly going to take some time before we get to, to full autonomy. But in the meantime, there are a number of other technologies that are being rolled out that, that get us on that path. Things from lane departure warnings to automatic emergency braking, uh, all of these uh, new technologies are, are going to save lives. Uh, yeah, but they all require sophisticated software, all require semiconductor chips uh, once again. So my question for you, sir, is how will securing our supply chains uh, for semiconductor chips facilitate the development of life-saving technologies that fall short of uh, automation, but also called advanced driver assistance systems uh, as we await for the fully autonomous future? Uh, again, thank you, Senator. Uh, the, you know, Safety is, is at the heart of what our suppliers and automotive makers are doing every day. Um, you know, it, it is really job one. And so we have always been investing in technologies that would improve safety. And so making sure that we are able to uh, you know, have the supply chain that produces the things necessary uh, on a consistent basis is really important. I mean, as Mr. Dawes mentioned, you know, there are choices having to be made about things that are going into vehicles, and those are somewhat, you know, comfort things, but the safety critical systems are the things that we continue to focus on, and we have, have not been compromised in any way in those things, and so I think our members continue to look at these, these safety critical technologies and these advancements of being able to provide these at all levels. Uh, for our consumers to make sure that they're in place. And so making sure that we have a, a robust, resilient, reliable uh, domestic supply chain that, that will provide the semiconductor chips and the things we need to be able to continue these advancements is, is extremely important. And, and again, the legislation that, that you put forward and that your bipartisan support that you've led is really important. A signal from the government, a signal from, uh, from your colleagues that says, you know, we are putting safety at the forefront. Safety technologies are extremely important. So we, we want to continue to work with you to make sure that we are able to continue to, to lead the nation and lead the world uh, in implementing new safety technologies. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rance, for those comments. Mr. Stevens, um, as we were talking about autonomous uh, and, and AVs, uh, I think the, the question, there isn't a question if we're going to get there. Uh, it's, it's coming. It's just a matter of what time, time frame. But the outstanding question uh, that we have to resolve, and one that I'm very passionate about, is whether or not the United States will maintain its leadership in the development of autonomous vehicles, or we're going to cede this ground somewhere else. And we can't do that. It has to be here in the, in the United States. Uh, but uh, in order for the United States to, uh, to dominate uh, the future, uh, we have to have laws uh, and regulations that actually facilitate uh, the safe development uh, of these autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, as you're well aware, our current uh, regulatory frameworks are, are simply outdated. Uh, they're not designed to deal with self-driving cars. They always assume there's a human uh, as a driver, and that's a good assumption right now. That's totally accurate. Uh, but uh, things will, will change in the years ahead. Uh, and certainly, I'm going to continue to work on legislation to, to modify those regulations. But my question to you, Mr. Stevens, could you expand on the economic impact that autonomous vehicles will have on Michigan? And quite frankly, what will happen if we lose our leadership in autonomous uh, vehicles? Certainly. Well, we are always proud to say that Michigan is a epicenter, a global epicenter for mobility. Um, but we're also not so naive to think that everybody doesn't want to be that global epicenter too. And so that's been why we've been focused since really 2015 as a state to bring together the parties. Policy has been at the forefront of it. Michigan has under Governor Snyder and now under Governor Whitmer maintained its focus on making sure we have the most progressive safety first policy for autonomous vehicle development. Now, a lot of the attention and focus on autonomous vehicles, autonomous vehicles uh, actually dimmed a little bit through the beginning of the pandemic. And there's no question about that. Uh, many companies didn't put the R&D in the last couple of years, but the companies who are core to this industry, Cruise Automation, Waymo, Argo, Aurora, uh, and the Chinese uh, and also some of the Europeans have not stopped to focus on this. Number one, because it can save lives. We know that this technology 
can really, really benefit that for the roads from that standpoint. But the economic opportunity and monetization, when you look at the development of advanced driver assistance systems, is huge. So that's why we're so focused on here in Michigan. But like all the other things we've talked about today, it's incumbent and critical for America to make sure that we protect the intellectual capital, make sure it's developed here and stays here, and that we control not just it from a national security standpoint, but an economic opportunity standpoint also. All right, thank you. Mr. Francis, I know you think a lot about this uh, as well. What, what do we need to do to make sure this stays in the United States? Uh, well, Senator, I, I think that, you know, good public policy is important. Uh, you know, creating opportunities for, uh, you know, testing and deployment, making sure that, um, you know, communities have what it takes to do these types of things. And our AV roadmap, one of the things that we had suggested is, uh, you know, updates to the, what we call the manual of uniform traffic control devices. And that is, you know, providing grants for a wide range of communities um, for widespread testing and deployment, both rural and urban. So it's, it's creating those types of policies that, um, you know, match the investment that our companies are putting into it that allows them to begin to get these things on the road. Because it, as you mentioned, it has an, an incredible opportunity for uh, opening up personal mobility for all different types of communities. And so, you know, if we're, if we're going to make sure that, you know, we are leading the world and leading the nation uh, we need to make sure that we are, are manufacturing the components here, that we are creating test beds here, that we are creating opportunities for deployment here that can showcase what autonomous uh, technology can do. And, that, and that's going to be an incremental change. It's not going to be overnight. We know that. And so that's the thing that will allow consumers and suppliers and everyone to, to participate in that transition. All right. Thank you. Certainly, we are in a very transitory time. Uh, change is happening quickly. And my question, my question for you, Mr. Dawes, is uh, we want to make sure uh, workers are fully prepared uh, for these changes and share uh, in the, the opportunities that are there. So if you could elaborate, you've already discussed it um, somewhat, but if you could elaborate on how Congress specifically can support workers to ensure that they have uh, the preparation necessary to embrace this future uh, when it comes to technological changes. Uh, changes that we can't even probably predict today. Things are gonna be different uh, a week or a month uh, from now. What more can Congress do to help workers? Well, I think some of what Congress can do is, is when people get educated on a change or educating, educated on a purpose, they understand it more. And when they understand it more, they embrace it more and, and they realize that, hey, this is gonna be part of my life. This is going to be um, where we're gonna go. Um, I think the investment in, in American people is, is a huge, I think that shows the leadership, that shows by example, that we know you can do it. We have the faith you can do it. You have shown over time that you have done it in the history of this country, time after time after time. This is no different. We're just going into a little different, little different uh, program than what we're used to. And um, we're counting on you, America. We're counting on you men and women in this proud, great country. So we're willing to show you and give you the tools for your toolbox. Let's do it. Very good. Amen. That's all I say to that. So I w appreciate uh, all of your testimony. I'll have one last question uh, as we wrap up. Uh, this time has gone by very quickly. And my last question is uh, for you, Mr. Rathard. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, Michigan's very proud to have welcomed uh, your company uh, to Ann Arbor. Uh, and when we look at the semiconductor industry, uh, and how it makes investments, uh, we, we tend to see a pattern of clusters, which is not unusual to the semiconductor industry, fairly typical of uh, all industries. Uh, companies always uh, gain uh, synergies by being uh, close to, to one another. So my question to you, sir, is with KLA uh, helping lead the way here in Michigan, how do you think Michigan can leverage your presence in Ann Arbor to grow the semiconductor uh, industry footprint here in Michigan? I believe when the word gets out about the skilled workers that KLA is finding here in Michigan, with the talent and the capability and the success we're going to demonstrate here, as well, frankly, as some of the cost savings and cost benefits of being here in Michigan, I think uh, it'll take on a life of its own, frankly, Senator. But certainly, we welcome any kind of efforts to advance that uh, through the Chamber of Commerce here or with our partners with the Michigan Economic. Uh, uh, folks. We're, we're happy to partner with them and 
and uh, highlight our success here. We're sure it's going to have a very successful outcome, and that should just naturally bring some of our peer companies here when the word gets out. Well, we welcome your success. Success breeds success, and so we will uh, continue to, to build on that. Uh, before I wrap up today's hearing, I'd like to address um, some administrative issues. Uh, first off, the, the hearing record will remain open for two weeks until April 11th of 2022. Uh, any senators or others who would like to submit uh, questions for the record uh, should do so by April 11th. Uh, we ask that witnesses provide responses to the committee as quickly as possible, but uh, no later than uh, April 25th. Uh, with that said, um, in closing, uh, I guess so the big question is, what have, what have, uh, have, what have we all learned uh, here today? And at, at first, I'd say uh, we all know that uh, automobiles uh, already depend heavily on chips. In the future, this trend will only continue, and we cannot achieve an electric or an autonomous future or the safety as well as the environmental uh, benefits of these uh, vehicles without a secure supply of semiconductor chips. Second, uh, our supply chains are, or at least they were before the pandemic, efficient, uh, but they clearly are not resilient. For too many essential goods, including chips, uh, we rely too heavily on foreign suppliers, including suppliers who are often located uh, in unstable uh, parts of the world or are controlled by our adversaries. This means our supply chains are subjected to numerous uh, risks abroad, including from transnational shipping, which it can have uh, absolutely devastating consequences. Indeed, we've seen in the pandemic with medical supplies and with uh, automobile manufacturing, it's not uh, an understatement to say that these risks gravely threaten our national security as well as our economy. So then that leads to the next question. So what is the solution? Uh, and I think we need uh, to make things here in America. And uh, and I think uh, hopefully all of you would agree, and I want to make them in Michigan uh, specifically, but uh, America, the Michigan at first and foremost. And that's why I've worked to grow the domestic auto production and tackle uh, issues related to the chip shortage by fighting for funding to make chips in the United States. Uh, in addition uh, to onshoring uh, semiconductor supply chains through legislation I authored, uh, which is now passed uh, through the House. The bottom line is we have the greatest uh, workers in the world uh, the greatest drive uh, for innovation and certainly I think the greatest uh, potential of any nation on the earth. Uh, we need uh, electric and autonomous vehicles to save our planet as well as to save lives uh, on the road and we need to make them here in the United States of America. Uh, if we uh, need pharmaceuticals, uh, medical devices and vaccines to stay healthy, we should be making those uh, in America as well. And if we need chips to stay competitive in the global economy, we need to make them in America. The, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit uh, and the work ethic of our state and nation uh, literally built the American middle class and helped make America the superpower in the 20th uh, century. And in the 21st century, we have everything we need to succeed here at home. And that's why I'll continue to fight for the future. I wanna certainly thank our participants who I know share that vision too, to fight for the future and to continue to support uh, the United States and our manufacturing abilities as the greatest nation on earth. So thank you for your participation uh, here today. Uh, we will now conclude this hearing. This hearing is now adjourned.